Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class. I don't know. Is this four? Three. 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 Okay, good. Because we got so much still to cover and uh, so many more paintings to make. So I'm glad that it's class three. And this will be kind of part two of um, learning to see values and colors and keeping them within their light or shadow family. Um, so I'm going to very quickly, we're going to start today by me just jumping over to the easel because I'm going to introduce an exercise that's optional or something that you could work on um, throughout the rest of the course. This is kind of a for you, but I think it's going to be a good way to describe um, my thinking behind and what I want you to understand behind keeping our colors in the light and color or light and shadow families. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to the easel. I've got some acrylics, uh, black and white acrylics, and I'm going to go ahead and paint up. Uh, I've got six little squares that I divided. Actually, I can just drop over and we can keep talking while I'm doing that. Silver budget. Silver budget is connected. Ready to there. So we can get a little closer and see what we're working on. So you can see I just took a 12 by 12 piece of paper. Um, I actually even taped it to last week's painting just to have a surface. Um, that way I didn't have to change over. And I divided it with some blue painter's tape, whatever you want. If you just want to, you know, draw some lines or whatever else. Um, and very quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I grab my acrylic paint and my little mixing tray here, and I'm just going to mix up some different values of gray. I'm going to do lighter, a little darker, a little darker to the darkest one here. And then I'm just going to very quickly do two quick landscape paintings um, in black and white or in grayscale. And then I'm going to come back over to the computer and we are going to discuss um, examples of uh, previous artists using what I'm going to be showing you today. And that will allow this, uh, the acrylics to dry enough that I can paint over them with the oil paints, I hope. Um, I also like to uh, give a little bit of feedback on some of your paintings, but there is quite a bit to cover today. So I won't, the critique session or feedback session is going to be really short. So anyways, I'm just going to squeeze out some black and some white acrylic paint. Um, Laura, while I'm doing that, will you talk a little bit about um, your experience using acrylic underpainting? You were saying that some of your paint has been having a hard time sticking. Um, a little more about that. I, I bought some cheap white acrylic, you know, like a quart size. And um, it's great for putting down an underpainting, but it has a kind of a chalky uh, character when it dries and it doesn't have as much adhesion as a high quality acrylic. So if you happen to put some tape on your paint, painting for some other reason, and then you pull the tape off, you'll actually pull off all the acrylic that is over the, um, the cheap acrylic or any oil surface I've noticed. So I'm trying, I'm trying to paint with just a higher quality um, white, white and black, black and white acrylics as my underpainting, see how that goes. Yeah, these are a slightly higher grade um, acrylic paint, I believe. Um, if you were in my last class, I showed you, I have a whole box filled with black and white acrylic paints of all different sorts, because I'm experimenting with that very thing. Um, I have not, personally had the issue of the paint lifting up, but I could totally see that. So what I'm thinking is happening is with the cheaper acrylic paint is whatever the acrylic uh, in there, the thing that's the binder, the glue that's holding the pigment down is just not very good. Um, right. Big, big tubs of, you know, acrylic paint are, you know, the end result is usually a kindergarten or, you know, a middle school somewhere where you know kids are just splashing and they're not going back over it with oil paints or blue painters tape or 
anything like that. But I, I appreciate any and all feedback you guys have to um, your materials and the different exercises that I have. Because um, for me, painting is a journey. I'm hopefully continuing to get better and incorporate new ideas. And a lot of the things I'm showing you, like doing acrylic underpaintings, is even kind of new to me in the last, I think, year. Laura, when we when did you take the class at Manuka? That was, really was last cool. last last June. Last June, so not even a year that I've kind of been. Um, really, you you you'd only just started it then. Yeah, not wow. then, but right around that time. Wow, I, re I remember you starting it after because uh, I started with you in the winter of last year. Okay, good. and I think it might have been the second or third one that you did. But you know what? I've seen more and more people um, referencing this technique. Yeah, yeah. I just read about it from one of my um, favorite gentlemen who writes on art that he does a lot of them using uh, burnt umber acrylic paint. Oh, interesting. Yeah, especially doing plain air. Um, my only hesitancy, and I, I will probably experiment with that, but my only hesitancy is that it's not enough oftentimes if you want longevity in your painting that acrylic is dry to the touch. It does prefer to have a curing time, which is approximately one to three days, depending on the ambient Interesting. atmosphere yeah. and surroundings. So, you know, in the middle of winter, I would probably say three days, but in the summer, probably, you know, one day. But that's just, you know, it's kind of experimental. So anyways, what I'm going to do, like I said, is I've got these four little squares. Um, I'm going to paint, I'm going to zoom in. Paint the first one really quite light, but I don't want anything white or black. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of my black paint, quite a bit of my white paint. Maybe just a touch of water, just a smoke. Michael, your microphone doesn't sound as strong as it usually does to me. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I where it's recording from. Okay, let's see which microphone it's using. I have three different microphones set up, but one of them should be the one that's the most powerful. Better. Yeah, well, right. Okay, so it's recording off this microphone. Let's see. Maybe I'll just talk a little louder, too. Um, oh, you know why, too, maybe, is I have it plugged into a different port. Um, but I'm out of plugs, so it's my only option. So let me, because uh, right now I'm standing right next to the microphone. Let me step back. Um, and uh, and then could you pin yourself to Mike or something? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the reminder on that. I appreciate it. Spotlight for everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep, takes a village telling you. All right, well, how about if I just talk a tiny bit louder? Does that sound okay? As I move further away from the microphone? Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. it's okay. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter than that. So I, can get... I, I can hear you fine. I, I actually turned down my volume. Ah, you're like, why is Mike yelling at us? <laughs> just the beginning of class, he couldn't be mad already. All right, add a tiny bit more black to that, make it a little bit more, a little bit darker. I hope. Darker again, let's get it to kind of a level seven or so. That looks really quite dark, doesn't it? Nice. 
Is that a pretty good? I might darken this one just a touch so that they're kind of an even shift. Is there a painting under there? <laughs> Behind it is yet last week's painting. Yeah, I just taped uh. this, the paper on top of that. So oh, okay. I'm done with this, I can just rip it off and not waste your time transferring over. What I'm gonna do now on my fourth one, and this, I just came up with this idea, is I'm gonna create a little bit of a transition So you know what else I discovered? I don't. This is not archival, but if you've got a, an oil painting and you just want to use it as a surface and you want to start out with black and white acrylic, spray it with Montana Gold oil paint. I mean, Montana Gold spray paint first, the acrylic, Montana Gold acrylic spray paint. And it's, why don't you think that's archival? No, I don't think it is. But it's, it's, a, great, it's a great substrate for applying acrylics. You can't apply acrylic directly to the oil because it won't stick or you'll have you'll have like resist problems. Right, yeah, for sure. But, but that particular spray paint, which I just happened to have a can of, is really compatible with acrylic, strangely. Um, and since I don't expect any of my pieces to be, you know, under the scrutiny of a Smithsonian restorer, um, <laughs> I just use it for experimentation. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's really liberating, right? To just know that you know what this painting is for me it's for now it's for putting this information down i'm just going to give these a quick uh gray tone i'm going to paint the most stupidest most basic landscapes on here A lot of times when I do my acrylic uh, underpaintings, I will just give kind of a nice mid value gray um, to the surface, just so that I don't have the problem of the white and then the um, other paint, you know, I just build it up real quick. And that way I'll actually go in with white paint to create my lights versus just, uh, Me getting stingy with my paint, just trying to push it farther, cover more, scrub, scrub, scrub. Did you ever get a hair dryer for your studio? I never did. <laughs> you should. They are so fabulous for working with acrylics. That's, yeah, that's a good idea, but nope, I never did. Also, they're, they're great for removing tape. If you've had tape on something for a long, long time and it doesn't come off very easily, just heat it up with a hairdryer, it rolls right off. Blue tape. Blue tape, uh, any color masking tape. Good to know. Let me grab a couple uh, old dilapidated brushes. I usually don't try to, I try not to mix. I've got a whole bucket of like, instead of throwing my brushes away, they just go into the coffee tin. Um, and so a lot of times those will be my acrylic brushes. Uh, uh, so they get one last chance at, at, uh, at having meaning. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint um, a tree shape on here using, I'm going to make a fairly dark, just kind of a shrub. Let's give it a little maybe another one a little further back. So I'm going to lighten those darks up on it. And I'm going to go ahead and give that tree a little bit of light back there on it. And the light on this is going to be coming from my left side. Let's bring some of that light onto my foreground tree as well. So 
kind of half lit from the right set from the, the as if the lights coming across from the right side. I don't want such a huge value jump in them. All right, let's put some sky in there. Oh, should have used a clean brush. Thought I cleaned it enough to use that brush. I'm just gonna grab a new, oh, sorry, elbow of the camera. Grab a new brush and I'm gonna go towards close to white. It's gonna be really light gray. Just gonna carve out those tree shapes I just put in there a little bit using that light value. So I've got two nice little trees. All right, so you can kind of see that there. It's kind of got a couple different values going on. Um, let's get back to that dark brush. And uh, what should I put in there? You know what, I think that'll be about enough for that one. So now, number two, man, this thing is a brick. Well, some of these brushes, evidently I didn't clean very much before putting them into retirement. They're just like daggers. All right, number two, let's do my generic th uh, four value landscape painting. So we'll start with some trees. Give those kind of a lighter side. It's a pretty big jump in value. I should have made a, a mix a couple of different values ahead of time. Uh, let's give it a mountain. Actually, we'll just leave what's there as the mountain. Let's put some trees further back there. A line of trees. Not too light. It needs to be slightly darker than the gray, or should be. Let's give ourselves a nice little creek as I'm. And that's my mountain stuff. Let's get back into that sky. It's not quite to white what I'm going to do here, but it's quite light. So very high key or bright key, high value, bright value key. And have the same light source. These uh, two scenes could be kind of in the same environment from the light coming from the left to the right. It could be a diptych. There you go, almost, huh? Kind of lines up nicely. So I have a question about when you do diptychs and triptychs and whatnot. Yeah, please. Do you sign one or all of the panels when you're done? I'll sign them all on the back, but I... Um... Oh yeah, we had this discussion, right? Are you the one that... Yes, right, okay. Yeah, Never mind. It kind of goes by how it looks. It can go, you know, you can have that, um, if it's for a client, you can have that discussion with them. You know, you can, you can usually try to hide a signature pretty well. So it's not too in the way. Um, I, I've had some paintings in the past. I did these great big paintings for a hotel. I think it ended up being six feet tall by 20 feet wide done in 
Wow. Four panels, 20 feet wide by six feet tall. So it would have been five panels wide, I think. That, does, that seems like a lot, but maybe. Um, it was a while ago, of course. Um, and uh, they, uh, you know, hung them all together. They go great. It's a big waterfall scene, um, which was tough because it's a horizontal design. Um, and, uh, but they were like, you know, what if we move it? What do we do? And so I tried to design each individual panel so that it could be a painting on its own. Um, right. You know, I think some of them would be definitely a little more desirable than the others, like the one with the focal waterfall and stuff. Um, let's make these mountains more pronounced so that they're, we have something to paint. I'm going to make these mountains big. We're in the Tetons, baby. Man, these acrylics really dry fast. My little piles of gray are already tacked yeah. up. All right, maybe that's not the Tetons. Maybe that's just Idaho or Montana or somewhere. Yes. Um, okay, so you can see we've got our very nice basic. This tree is too dark because I don't want to worry too much about black. So I'm going to go ahead and lighten my shadow area a little bit. Also, what about, don't the trees need cast shadows? <laughs> sure, let's do that too. Good idea, thank you. And you know what? There's also a big tree right here to the right and it's casting a shadow. Oh yeah. <laughs> Love me some- With, with tree holes on the ground, yeah. Yeah, Ramona Youngquist special. A lot of the California Impressionists would kind of do that where they'd have a nice cast shadow in the foreground. A little bit of shadow coming over the water, but it's also reflecting the sky, so it's not going to be too dark. It's always a tricky thing. It's, I love painting um, creeks in the forest. But man, you get so much to deal with in the, you know, the reflections and the cast shadows and the depth of the water and the movement of the water. It's so many things to try to keep in mind. That added so much interest when you added the foreground shadow. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'll show you some of Ramona's paintings. If you're a student in my class, you'll probably see a Ramona painting come up. Uh, oh, what's her last name again? Young Quist, Y-O-U-N-Q-U-I-S-T. She is a local painter, a good friend. And uh, if you are into cooking, she also has a little cooking show on Facebook. <laughs> She's just awesome. She's such a, such a fun spirit of a person. She's just um, she and I traveled to Italy together to paint and had a great time. It's the first time she'd ever left the country. So it was kind of an honor that she trusted me to, maybe she'd been to Mexico. Maybe it's just, you know, this part of the world. Um, but anyways, okay, that look okay. So we've got a light square, a medium square, a darker light, or, you know, darker square, but not black, uh, a little grayscale here with, you know, white probably won't show when I pull up the tape and there's nothing really, really dark. I've got two trees just sitting there hanging out. Let's do a cast shadow on there too. We're having so much fun. You can see I test it. I'm like, oh, that's not a cast shadow. That'd be a light ray coming through. Messy, messy, messy. Imagine if this is the first time you tuned into one of my classes, you'd be like, uh, money back, please. What the heck is he doing? <laughs> cool. All right. So now we're going to take a break. I'm going to, man, I put out way too much acrylic paint. 
I'm going to go ahead and spray that with a little mister. So maybe I have a chance of saving it after class or during one of our breaks. Um, a, I, I can't remember if it was one of you that told me, but it, a great way to save acrylic paint is to put it into a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water. And then I just cut the corner of the Ziploc bag and squeeze it out. Um, Cause I got a lot, I, I only use probably a third of it of what I put out there. So I'm just going to give it a quick misting or um, what I'll also do to save it is take a paper towel, very lightly put on top of it, just sitting right on top. And I'm just going to miss that. So ta -da. that will keep that paint, hopefully. And all my brushes go into the water so they don't dry out acrylics. That's, you know, I kill brushes with acrylic paint because they sure dry out faster than I'm used to with the oils. The oil brushes I can leave out overnight and uh, come back to and clean the next day. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a, what I'm going to do is I plan to mix colors and then I'm gonna make those colors shift to these values. So I'm gonna be putting the colors on here. So let's say um, I may, well, we'll get back to it, but that I'm just gonna to try to match the color to the value and put it on so you can see where it lies on here. Um, and then the big thing here is um, doing the same thing. So if I mix the green the, you know, in the shadows, it'll probably be cooler. It'll be a touch darker. And then as I go to the light side of the shrubbery, it's gonna get a little warmer because it's in the light, you know, depending on if you have a warm light or a cool light, and I'll show you examples of both. Um, and it'll get, you know, lighter a little bit, not too much. You can see that even this little painting here, that it appears like there's a light side and a shadow side, even though it's not a big value jump at all, right? So we're gonna play with temperature warmer and cooler, but we're going to keep our values quite similar. Same thing. I'm going to light up the right side of the mountains a little bit, but I'm going to keep it within the same values. As things recede into space, you'll notice that their values get closer together. That's a really good hint. If you put really big value jumps back here in these trees that aren't in the value jumps aren't up here, it's going to look odd unless you really want us to focus on the mountains and not up here because our eyes are attracted to strong value shifts. Let me put the acrylics away and my little mister bottle and be right over. So I had set up a second recording system, um, another app. I was telling Denise about that to record um, when I get up to the easel. And actually that looks clearer than it did last class. I've been messing with the settings and different things. So hopefully that does not look a little bit clearer than last week. I mean, maybe who can remember, right? But um, anyways, I've been messing with settings, but I also uh, was interested in another recording device because Zoom automatically lowers the um, quality just you know so it can travel through the uh, internet to you guys. Um, so I was trying to record secondarily um, when I'm at the easel that I would uh, share with you guys later, but it didn't work. For, I don't know uh -huh. if I'm not able to do both at the same time. So unfortunately that idea as of right now is not working. So I'll keep working on ways to get you the best image quality that I can. Um, but as of right now, it looks like that is it. Michael, last week, it, it seemed like it was focusing on your back. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'll just have to work so, on belts. Could you zoom your camera in um, so we can see the brush strokes on the acrylic just for a second? Sure. Just, to re just to remind me that ugly is okay. Ugly. Not that they're ugly. Not that they're ugly. But. They're ugly. That's all right. They're they're crazy. But I'm just. It's just so we can match color to value. Seeing color yeah. as value is really hard for a lot of people. 
All right, and my sec other camera is now not working again. Oh, nope, it is. Okay, crazy. All right, welcome back, and let's go. Um, I'm just going to, do you guys mind if I do this in reverse order and we get to the critique last? That way I'll know how much time I have to spend with you guys. Um, That's fine. Cool, I am going fine with me. to quickly jump over to, um, I shared all the images. So if you wanna see them, or if you even wanna help me label them, they're under the media section on the Facebook page. You go to the more arrow up top where it goes about discussion featured. And at the very far right, at least for me in my viewing is a more area. You'll click that little area arrow down beneath that is media, click that open. And then there's um, photos, videos, and albums. Go to the albums. And I have a whole section of light and shadow colors. Um, if you click that open, there's 22 references I put in there of other artists work. Most of a lot of Monet's, a couple Ramona Youngquists, I know Vanus Barbarian, Mark, Boone, Mark Bonet, uh, Anton Pavlenko, and a couple others, even a Maxfield Parish in there. Um, but I've also pulled them up on my uh, Adobe Photoshop so that I can um, show them to you a little bit bigger and zoom in and out and do some shifting. So anyways, those are there for you uh, when you wanna look at them or reference them. Um, but I'm gonna do screen share. And are we supposed to, I see that a lot of people have created albums, but I, I may have missed that discussion. It was a test. Uh, Laura came up with the idea, which is really a nice way to do it. Um, and you could lead us to it. I think, Laura, you could actually uh, put the link as well um, to your um, section. It's if you want to keep your stuff organized, so you're not having to scroll down through, you know, everybody's work um, or all the gibberish that I share with you guys each week. Because um, the, Wait, the you, you mean when we post in the group, we can link to our pictures in the album? No, it'd be the other way around. When you go to the album, you could just say, hey, I posted into my album. Here's the link if you want. It's not. And then they would just click it. And it well, I, it's just, it's, I found it difficult to put in the discussion the way the pictures were, you know, things that I most recently posted in my album that then I kind of regretted ever suggesting it. <laughs> but, yeah, it's a little, we're still trying to figure that out. So yeah, that's not okay. a... If you want well, to do it, me no, that's a great place to put them as well. Make an album. That way you can reference your own. Um, mm -hmm. You know, keeps them kind of a little bit more organized. You're, again, you're not scrolling through hundreds of, you know, photos and pictures and right, um, right. lessons. Are you guys seeing my Facebook page? I mean, my um, Photoshop. Photoshop. Yep. Seeing a nice yeah. one there. Um, I the think Light and Shadow album is great, by the way. Oh, good, good. So, thank you. Um, so I grabbed a couple of, um, let's see if I can get rid of these toolbars. Could you say again how we find that? Would you go to media, but I didn't get the rest. Albums. Albums. So media, then albums. And then in there is a light and shadow one. So I grabbed uh, these three um, paintings that Monet did. He was, you know, so great at doing these uh, scenes over and over and over under different um, settings, different times of day, different types of atmosphere. It's just amazing. I mean, he did so many. The hay, the haystacks are really famous, and then a cathedral whose name I can't remember right now. Uh, amazing. Um, I'll try to remember too, I just found a website with all high resolution Monet paintings. So that's why I grabbed these is because I can now zoom in and you can see the texture of the canvas and uh, his brushwork. And uh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so send me the link because Zoom has totally pixelated that for me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'll just find it. Um, okay. Well, it, it looks pixelated anyways, because it's a Monet. <laughs> um, <laughs> close Monet's paintings definitely, definitely fall apart. I think I told that story about my daughter. First time she saw a great big Monet water lilies at the Portland Art Museum. She was probably five or six and 
was standing right up close and she turns and of course there's a bunch of people because you know they just unveiled the Monet paintings at the museum and she just turns around she's like it's nothing and then I kind of <laughs> take her shoulders and pull her back 20 or 30 steps and she's like it's water lilies and then she <laughs> runs up again and it's nothing and then runs back it's water lilies and the whole gallery I thought would be so annoyed but they really found it to be fantastic and that's the magic of Monet is really, I mean, you squint your eyes and these paintings could become nearly, you know, kind of photographic. You know, squinting your eyes is kind of like going further away. Um, and, you know, they tighten up and it took me a long time to really appreciate that um, kind of work of just the illusion, the impression, right? That's where the name impressionism came from. It's just the impression of the place meant as a, a put down when, they, when a critic first used that term and, um, the impressionists embraced it and ran with it and uh man now impressionism is the most popular art form or most appreciated painting form out there so good anyways what i wanted to quickly talk to you about with these uh three different monets is for one i mean look at this super saturated high chroma right high the colors are rich and then we get over here and the colors are much duller they're warm, right? It's the cools are purple, but you know, there's a couple cool blues in there to set it off, but most of the shadows are more purple. So they're leaning, you know, you're getting away from these real saturated blues and dark greens and stuff like that. Um, so what Monet is doing is he's creating his value structure, right? Like this one has a wider value structure Okay, so you can picture, you know, the gray scale from black to white with all the grays in between. This one has a much higher variation in the value structure. Than this one. Right? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So when we think of Monet, we definitely consider him to be a colorist, right? There's um, some paintings he did of these really lightly colored, um, I think they're blossoming trees against this very, very faint blue background. In, um, the sky is very light blue. Um, and it's so interesting because you see these really delicate, beautiful petals on these trees beautifully because of the color contrast, the temperature contrast, right? That warmer yellow versus that cool blue. But when you change, I, I wasn't able to find that painting very quickly. If I do find it, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but when you turn that painting into black and white, the trees disappear. They're the exact same value as the blue of the sky. All right, and so that's what I'm hoping I'll show you with those gray bars that I brought up, you know, that I painted up there is that we can do warm colors, cool colors, you know, in between all the browns, all the grays. And it's about there where they lay on the value structure, where they lay on the value scale that helps them read. So anyways, I just thought that was really. So it seems like this would be something that would be very useful to master for painting clouds and skies because so, it seems like the color in the sky is not that different. I mean, the color of the clouds is the same value as the color of the sky surrounding it. Oftentimes, yeah. But when, <laughs> when I try that, I feel like I just fail so miserably. So any, any hints along that lines would be right. appreciated. Well, I think that today's uh, lesson and some of these corresponding exercises. So yeah, I'm looking up at the clouds here in this Monet painting. They're definitely lighter than the sky but sure, they're much more vibrant in color, right? I right. Mean, or, you know, the bouncing of the light in here. Let's, uh, let's keep moving on though. So Monet, thank you. Monet, thank you. Another one by him. This one's got more uh, separation in color than that cool purpley one did with the greens and the reds and the yellow and the whatever you want to call that kind of tan color. Um, let's go ahead and desaturate that guy real quick. But you can see how close these values are in the middle. Look at these, uh, the, the church structure itself. 
and you can really see this separation between the uh, gray, uh, the tanny, taupey color and that uh, terracotta roof, right? Because of the color shift, but when we go to the value shift, it's not that much. It's just barely there. So learning when are, what are you asking yourself? What am I seeing? Is it more of a value shift, lights and darks? Or is it more of a color shift? Is it somewhere different on the color wheel? Or, and then within that, within the color space, we think, can think temperature. Is it warmer? Is it cooler? Um, I think we've got some other examples of Monet here. Let's look at this one, right? Um, we had a student last class who painted this beautiful foggy, foggy bridge um, scene. And it was interesting to see how beautifully and subtly it showed up. But okay, so let's do a quick prognosis. What do we think the values are going to be here? Do you think it's compressed values? Uh, do you think there's a, a lot of values? What do you think here? Very compressed. Very compressed. Very compressed right? Yeah. It's definitely. Uh, and it's, where is it compressed? Is it high key, meaning all the lights, mid key or darker key? Mid. mid. Perfect, thank mid. you. A lot of people would see this, um, you know, people that haven't taken my classes, but uh, <laughs> would see this and think, oh, but look at the water, it's so, so bright, right? But it really isn't. Let's go ahead and desaturate that. Image adjust, desaturate. And look at that. If I put up a square of white next to it. Uh, the whole left side of the bridge just almost disappears. Sure does, right? Yeah, let's go back. So yeah, look at that. You can see the bridge fairly clearly. It's got very soft edges. But yeah, watch as, so you can really see that values. I mean, this whole part here completely disappears. Isn't that wild? Hmm. The values are the same in there but the color and the slight temperature shifts, but mostly it's just a color shift. I'm gonna, I grabbed a uh, color white. Let's see what size this is. I paint on there. Oh, very little, control Z. I'm gonna make it um, bigger, I think. How do I make my brush bigger? Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at it um, top to bottom, there's almost vertical stripes with the kind of yellowish on the, you know, on the middle right. And then, and then it goes a little more pur purpley or orangey and then green and then purple. Yeah. So for those of you that are brave, this is something I actually contemplated doing is in one of those two squares where I did the landscape, I would love for the brave amongst you to paint that. Paint that with your Wait. black and white acrylic, and then oh, to to paint a, an underpainting that has very small value shifts. Right. Yeah. Wow. See, can you bring it to this? You know, of course, you're not going to paint a Monet, but you know, the idea being there, it could be just big color splotches. What I did again is I grabbed white just to show you how much lighter that could have been. Right. Mm. Um, let's grab some black. How much darker this could have been. Now let's go back to our value study. Oh, it gets rid of the brush strokes. I'm gonna have to do a look how out of place that looks. <laughs> do you guys see how important this is? And yeah. how like, man, if your painting is just not reading right, it may be that you have your building back here way too dark, right? You have, oh man, I'm totally making Monet so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Things you can't do when you're in the museum, right? If I just made those, those uh, really dark back there, it just doesn't work, right? Right, yeah. Um, so you can use color as opposed to value, temperature shifts instead of value to do a lot of the heavy lifting that our values do. I consider myself more of a tonalist often 
meaning that it's all about my values, my lights and my darks and, you know, all, everything in between. But truthfully, color can do so much of that. So that's why a lot of times when people see my underpaintings, they'll just like, oh, there's, you know, it's nothing. It's just a couple big spots and a couple big values. And a lot of times that's enough. I think this painting is really important to learn that. Let's go to the inverse of that. Let's look at another Monet. All right, who wants to guess on this one when we're talking about values, just like we did last time? I think they're gonna leap out. That sunlight's gonna leap out and the right. be saturated. So and how is that? Why is that? What are the values doing here? Are they are they a lot narrow? more dark? Huh? A lot more darks. Yeah, and what also what inversely we've got brighter brights too, don't we? A very quick wide range. Wide range. Very good. So this painting is a very narrow range of values. This painting is a very wide range. I'm going to go ahead before I shift it to black and white. I've got my black brush. Sorry, Monet. Love you. <laughs> but it has very little middle value. Yeah, I bet we're right. Let's. I can't wait to flip it over to the um, grayscale. Where's a nice white section? I, I hesitate to put it up here because that's the focal point, but I'm going to put it close. I'm going to put it right here. All right, so I put my dark down here and you can see he went almost as dark as possible. And in lights, he really got close to being as light as possible as well. Um, let's go ahead and shift that into a grayscale. Image adjust, desaturate. And now you can see my, my white is quite a bit whiter. And that's really an interesting yeah. thing because I read, same mistake I tell you guys, is I'm reading the light bright color as lighter than it is. So yellow, our brain perceives often as brighter, lighter, sorry, on the value scale than it actually is. Um, and digital cameras do that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, cancel. And I'm just going to desaturate it without my black and white spots on there. So yeah, if we looked at this like this, we'd go, man, this is actually pretty darn dark. Most of it, he yeah, does that's amazing. his jumps. But what is amazing, right? Okay, it's kind of a simple design structure, right? If you, let's, um, how should I do that? Image adjustment, I'm gonna go, what I'm gonna do, brightness contrast. Okay, right, I'm gonna ex make the bright brighter and the darks darker. Um, real quick, and we're going to see his design structure, the underlying design structure. Maybe not make it that bright. Yeah. Right, it's pretty simple. Some guiding lines in, a canopy on top, and he's got this kind of window. And then here we can see, you know, a little bit, some of the mid-tones. I bright, maybe brighten those up a little much. That's what happens when you change this. Um, do you know how big this painting is? Oh, I really don't. It's not telling me on here. Um, if I, give me one half second. Do you guys see my, um, do you see little things popping up at the bottom here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to distract. I got so many windows open normally before. Yeah. Class, after class. Well, we can certainly look it up. I was just. Yeah. Um, anyways, you can see his design structure. So that's a cool way, kind of like doing the no tan or whatever else, right? We can see his design structure. There is, you know, again, about black and white. Um, and let's go back to color. So now that we know this underlying structure and we know his values, if we kind of were to squint our eyes or to simplify it, whatever way we wanted to do it, kind of think posterized, right? Big big swaths of color. So we don't have all these little roses, but imagine this all is one value. All of this is one value. All of this kind of back here is one value. Um, the darks is a value. We uh, see that within that value structure, now I'm gonna do, do some fun zooming. Let's investigate what's going on within. Let's look at down here where he's got a contrast between his lights and his darks. Look at just, Within these darks, what's going on? He's got some reds, some purples, some blues, some kind of really dark 
browny blacks. And then within the light, he's got the same thing. Look in this light, there's a touch of green and orangey yellow, but because he's keeping the values in the right place, right? The reading, but within each one of those colors, look how crazy he can be. This yeah. is really getting pixelated, maybe not as high a resolution as I thought. I thought it would be nicer than that. But um, yeah, so that's what I'm going to urge you to experiment with this week's painting or over the top of the painting that you've been working on is if you've got your value structure and you've got nice established values, what colors can you get in there and get away with, right? Look at up here. Look at all this crazy. But it looks like a dry brush technique. He does. He goes, uh, that's one thing I really learned is that there was not too much a la prima painting for Monet. A lot of his paintings got painted on for a long time. So he was letting them dry. Um, and that was a really pleasant surprise for me. And you could really see these dry drags of brush strokes um, across the tops of things where he needed little bursts of lighter areas or some new darks. He was not afraid to keep layering his paint. We'll even see that more when we look into his, let me fiddle the screen. So do you think, do you think he did that a la prima or with? Um, no, I do not. Over, over long periods of time, a lot of scumbling. Uh, over long periods of time. These paintings are, you know, especially as water lilies are gigantic, right? I mean, they're practically mm -hmm. mural sized. Um, if you've been ever lucky enough to get to, um, what is it, light layer? Le orange. L'orangerie. L'orangerie, yeah, not an orange, but l'orangerie, yeah, that place. Is that in, like is that in Paris? Where is yeah. that? In Paris. Paris. Yeah. It's like Mecca. You're just in these rooms surrounded by his paintings on all the walls, and they just, they just pull you in. Um, wow. So back to that painting with the path and the, and the overgrown tree canopy. Um, one of the things that leaps out to me <clears throat> is that the, you know, the, the purple there Down just seems the so pronounced in the color and that totally disappears when you desaturate it. Right. So, the, but that's saying, look how rich you can have colors and shadows. In those quotes that, that I put on the, um, the class, an uh, email that I sent out yesterday. Uh, it talks about that, about the, within the shadows, there's so much, even if it was Leo Tolstoy talking about, um, you know, more of a reference to life in general and maybe writing. Um, within the shadows, there's so much. I have a, a, a good friend of mine um, who I just don't understand how she sees. I don't know if she, it's only painting from bad photos or what, but her she sells and she shows, but I all, every time I look at her paintings, all I can think is she's missing a half the painting because her shadows are black, no matter if they're on the path or under the shrub or on the side, it's just darkness. And uh. I just think, man, you're missing so much opportunity for shadow colors. Look at this. I mean, that is chaos, right? That is just confetti falling from the sky and it's gorgeous and when we zoom out because it stays within the color family the value family it works i bet you you know if we went to the gallery and saw these there would be tons of color in here what he'll often do is have those warmer undercolors and then he puts these dark greens on top and then as they bleed together they get really quite quite dark but when you're there and you can see the light you know shining through the paint he's painting both very thick and very translucent in different areas. Um, yeah, I just learn you know, so much every time I get to go to a Monet show. What, what is his brush stroke for that thing that looks like wisteria? It looks like beautifully rendered wisteria, but you know, right where all that yellow is in the middle of the background, you know, on the right-hand side of this. Oh, to the right of that? Not, yeah. not this, just scroll over. Scroll up a bit. See that? See that yellow, greenish yellow right in there? 
what is that brushstroke that, that looks so dang it looks so dangly right he builds up his paint in such a way that yeah he can just kind of scumble or lightly brush on top you can see this brush stroke over here this yellow one you can just tell that that just skimmed across the tops of the paint um that's why a painting is never done it's only abandoned right you can just keep building it up <laughs> and building it up and that's why after last week's class was over you know I, I created a big crazy mess of a painting but i was like you know what i've got enough here i can build it and i'm going to be able to use some of that texture some of those underlying colors and i've got my values so now i can come in and really let my colors play let's let our colors play right i keep saying a light family and a shadow family but let's let each one of those families have a big party okay monet monet here's one more monet this is the first one i actually grabbed you know it's not one of my favorite paintings by any means of his but it even within his shadows you can see you know big shifts and within the colors down here on the bottom uh some nice big shifts uh it's gonna get past that one let's get away from there this is an ovanus barbarian um he was one of my early uh workshops i took um he, you might want to look to him a little bit laura for your clouds and ideas like that yeah yeah wow look at the upper right hand clouds that's amazing yeah, yeah he's really nice about that i've got a beautiful um little eight by ten painting of his um somewhere i don't even know where right now um but yeah look at within the tree right you can definitely see the shift from the shadow family to the light family and then look in here we would consider that a neutral i mean a mid sorry a mid but um for our thinking, I might consider that more in the shadow family, just a slightly lighter, brighter. Um, and you can do a three or four value, you know, painting if that helps you instead of just a two value. But we're just trying to keep things within because you can tell that these colors over here, right, these cool greens that are kind of in the middle, those are kind of reflected light from the sky. They're not catching the warm light of the sun. It's kind of a reflected cool light. So I would still kind of consider them more in the shadow family squinting our eyes will kind of help you to tell that's where a no tan remember the light black and white will really help you to make some of those hard choices um because a lot of times a lot of our painting exists in that mid range um yeah oh, i don't know it kind of feels more like it's in the light family here doesn't it it's just cool so i'm you know oftentimes surprised so I would say that that's almost the same value. In fact, what I'll do is grab a little reference of it and take my paintbrush and I'm gonna take, oh, that's huge on this one. And take it over here and let's see how much light, what how much darker it is than things in the, pretty close. If I squint my eyes, that's almost the same. Let's take it up towards a little lighter yeah. in the light family. There, it's a little darker, yeah. but still pretty close. It's closer than, in the shadow family right Close and the up. and the coolness is due to graying the color or bluing the color what uh what makes that particular green to read so cool uh, i mean it's bluer right this has got reds and yellows more in it and this has got more blue in it you know it doesn't probably have the red as much in it um, yeah, it's yeah. definitely kind of a grayed down color. Here's another test for anybody that does have Photoshop. I'm just going to grab and select that color. And then I can go over here. If you guys can see that, I'm going to click on the color itself that I selected. So when I select it here, it shows it over here. Now I click there. And what this does is it shows me its value. It's in between. It's very, we were right on. It's a mid value, right? Here's the lightest that green could be or, you know, without the add addition of white. Hmm. here's the darkest it's right fairly close to the middle it's not you know it doesn't have a lot of white in it it doesn't have a lot of black in it um and then i look over here and i'm sure that's going to be impossible to see but it's the arrows are pointing to the fact that it's right here right above my arrow so that helps me to go okay well it's green right it's green that leads a little bit closer to yellow than it does towards blue and then look how look how different the color swatch in in that uh, in that tool looks from the actual blot on the painting, which is directly below it. It looks like two shades darker. 
Yeah, and it does look more yellow. yellow. Comparison. Uh, actually, that may have been because of the pixel you clicked. So it, that might be an artifact of that. Yeah. So we can. Uh, or surrounded by white, it looks a lot dark. It's fun to do this, though, yeah. to go through. You can see there's the. Oh, it's amazing. Shows. Here's the reddish color on the top of that brush stroke. So even within that little area, he's got multiple shifts. Let's look. He is. Here's another thing. Boy, I'm just about to explode with excitement. I tell you this. He's the one that showed me um, optical mixing within a single brush stroke. <laughs> he would literally mix his colors into different piles. Then he would dip his left side of his brush into one color and his right side of his brush into another color. And then he may even dip it into a third color, the whole brush. So that as that top color goes away, he then starts to get into these other colors. Let's see if we can find one of his beautiful examples of that. Would they all be the same value? Yeah, or really close. I mean, he might get a little lighter, a little cooler, but like in this brush stroke here, you can see a little redder, a little whiter, a little cooler over here. Um, let me see. Yeah, you just it. have to be so comfortable with with ugly painting, you know? Yeah, he paints that. big and super juicy um, brush strokes. Uh, people really do like his work a lot. What's uh, his name? Ovanis. O-V-A-N-E-S, Berberian, B-E-R-B-A-R-I-A-N. But man, when he comes into, he, uh, when he gets excited and is yelling at you, to be a real artist, you must. Uh, I <laughs> nicknamed him Avanis the Barbarian. Can we, see, can we see that whole painting be saturated, please? Yep. All right, so there, we, let's look at it for real quick. Very saturated color. He's famous for these very saturated colors strong lights and darks he paints tons and tons and tons of sunsets tons um uh look let's desaturate him image adjust he also uh tones his canvases a mid value blue gray really yeah interesting right because he those warm colors really sing against that this painting doesn't appear to have a whole lot of canvas showing but some of them really do um, what am I doing? Desaturate. Okay. So look at, like, we saw these as really big jumps, but look at the sky as that much lighter. So that's an important thing to remember oftentimes is within a dark tree, the lights within that dark tree are still going to be quite dark. Right? Yeah. Let's go back. Wow. Isn't that fun? Oh, that gold. Just. Yeah. And boy, does he, I mean, your eye knows where to go, right? Boom. Try to not look at this spot. You, your eye will go away for a minute, but it's almost like I have to like physically tell my brain, let's go look at the sky. No, the barn. Let's go look at the <laughs> edge of this tree. No, the barn. <laughs> um, it's got the high uh, value contrast. It's got the smaller details. It's got sharp edges and but most importantly, it's got the biggest color and temperature contrast all within this area, right? So he's playing up all the tools. And that that blob of high chroma turquoise over the purple roof almost looks like it doesn't belong there. Yeah, it's it's vibrant, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does kind of float a little bit. You know, maybe if I was his teacher and was yelling at him, if you want to be a real artist, <laughs> maybe I would say to desaturate that a little bit. Um, but, you know, he's a voluntary and he gets to do what he wants. But Michael, like um, one, um, one of the things that, I, that blows my mind and I can't get my, I mean, my head around is um, like um, Loomis who wrote Creative Illustration that book that mm -hmm. that okay and he talks about the zones of separation and so really if you think about this painting and his sky and how that affects the zone of separation it's i don't think that turquoise is off at all i mean yeah there you go see it's, right. the value's dead on yeah it's right on. It's up to you to decide is that, you know, compared especially to other parts of the sky, is that too vibrant of a color? Um, you know, but I. <laughs> but it also makes you go right to that barn. So. Yeah, yeah. the whole 
And it looks like he might have dragged a little of that into the rooftop. Um, you Broke can see a little in. of that turquoise ish sort of on top of the, the roof. He grated it, but it's duller. Yeah, he yeah. broke the edge he here. He grated it with yeah. it. And that allows our eye to skim. Again, I think, you know, this for sure. And look <laughs> at that. I mean, that is a beautiful image right there. Just what I'm showing you would be. A look, look how fat those brush strokes are. Jesus. Oh, they're juicy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I should pull up a different, let me see if I can, uh, I'm not going to do it. Maybe for one of the other classes, I'll try to pull up an Anton Pavlenko. He's my good painting friend and guy I travel with and do anyways. He, that guy paints, his paints like an inch thick. Is that a multi, multi-loaded brush stroke right on the corner of that barn there, that purple and orange? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't drag. Yeah. And, so I bet you he dipped his brush and a, a total, total guess. Dip, yeah, but that is a multi-loaded brush stroke. And if not, look at this green as he drags it down, it turns to red. So he may have dipped into the kind of cool red and then into the green and then let it drag. And as it drags off, it has a little mix and then it gets to the red. It, there's so much cool stuff you can do when you begin to use paint. Note to self. <laughs> I know, but it's you have to be very careful not to uh, let the values get away with, get, you know, get away from you. And then you had just have a big Rorschach right. test or something. So let's you know? pretend, let's pretend that um, we had done our value study, right? And on the side of our value study, I also had a piece of paper maybe that I painted with my grayscale on there. I can mix those colors in great big piles, put them up against my value study on the right side. Did you know that you can paint on two things at one time? You can actually have a piece of paper off to the side where you can experiment uh -huh. and try things. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, that will help us get closer. It'll take a little more time maybe, but you know, what has he got on here? A couple hundred brush strokes, it looks like, you know, whereas the rest of us are painting thousands of brush strokes on our little paintings. <laughs> so, you know, he, he can get away with it. And here's the other thing, Laura, I give you and all of you permission to completely fudge this painting up. As long as you tell me I'm going for it and you show it and you, I want you to learn. I don't. I find that so hard to do though. Yeah. And I keep trying to remind myself, you know? Totally. Huh. The cool thing and is let, you let it dry or take your palette knife to it and scrape it off. If you're really, yeah. you know, really on the wrong value, just take your palette knife and pull it right back off. You save the paint, you can use it again. When Anton and I do our dueling easels where we both paint on the same paintings, it is so funny, you know, I'll walk when we do our first or second switch of the painting, you know, so I'll be painting on mine for 15 minutes and then we do a switch and I go and paint on his and he paints on mine. I'll take my palette knife off and scrape up a whole bunch of his paint. It's, you know, it's for show mostly, but I scrape off a bunch of his paint and load it onto my panel, my palette, as if like I'm going to use that paint later um, because he just uses so darn much. Um, yeah, so that's that's Anton Pavlenko. Pavlenko, yeah. He teaches every once in a while at OSA. And he and I do joint workshops uh, about once a year, um, usually out at the coast. Really, and I, I have a question then. Um, so if we, as our experiment or as our assignment, um, make a value study like that in, in the black and white and uh, gray, and then as we're adding color, help summarize to me what we should be thinking about in terms of how we build our piles of color and we we basically are either wanting to look at the both the value of the col the color temperature and what we put next to it it's there's so much to think about so much to think about michelle there's so much and you're not going to get it in this painting i i, mean, I have a technical question painting and you're not going to get it you know this year but you're going to get closer and you're going to experiment and you're going to play and that's the only way we can learn um, I was listening to a, a nice lecture this morning um, and it was the guy was saying, you know, I was addicted to learning. 
Mm. And I was in, a, um, he called himself a, a librarian or a custodian of knowledge. Yeah. And he loved to talk about it and he loved to do it, but without action, knowledge is basically worthless. We can, you know, impress our friends at cocktail parties, but without action, knowledge is worthless. And so many of us, me included, will go through these big spells where I'm just collecting and I'm collecting. Um, so I, I, again, I like, I call myself the librarian, right? The collector of knowledge. So I can share it with you when I'm teaching. But I, a couple of years ago, I uh, changed it from librarian to uh, librarian warrior. <laughs> Warriors go into action, right? Or a warrior monk is another one. I like the idea of, <laughs> right? So we're gathering information. That's what we're doing right now. We're looking, we're observing, but without action, it's, it's nothing. It's worthless. It's almost worse than worthless because we know it's there and it hurts us. <laughs> it hurts our psyche. So action, action, action. Be, and that's why I say be willing to fail. Fail hard. Fail fast. Fail often. Have fun. Remember that it's just painting. Learn from when it didn't work, Michelle. Put down that brush stroke and say, okay, that did not work. Why? Was it the values are too light or too dark? Is it the color is off? It's, it's green when I needed it to be a turquoise. It's green when, a, boy, it really could have been a purpley green color. You know, um, is it the temperature? Okay, it's on. Let's look at these rocks of Maxfield Parish, the master of light and shadow and temperature shifts, right? You know, there's no mistaking his light family and his shadow family whenever you look at a Maxfield Parish. So anyways, we're just asking all those things. Did it work? Yes. Why or why not? Did it not work? Does it need work? Okay, fine. That's great. We're learning from both, right? Maxfield Parrish. So he did his paintings in blue under paintings also. Mm. Um, it's like Avonis, but Avonis doesn't do value studies underneath. So don't be mistaken into that. But Avonis is much more direct. He just kind of attacks it but he's been doing it for a long time. Um, Maxfield Parrish would do a completely blue and white painting with different values of blue coming all the way up to the very dark. Um, if you go and see some of his forest scenes and stuff, there's very few paintings of his that are unfinished, um, but there are a couple out there where you can see, you know, as he kind of completed certain areas and what was happening. But, and then he worked in very transparent layers very transparent, thin glazes, one on top of the other. And basically he created the illusion of glowing on his surfaces. They even named a blue after him. There's a blue, a Maxfield Parish blue out there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. One, one thing I notice here is um, he uses the golds in the foreground, leaves them out of the background. So, and it looks like there's, there's that cloud looming over the mountain on the left. And so he adds gold in there and it really brings it forward. It does, doesn't it? Especially those cool ones. Yeah, so yellow comes forward. Red is the next color and then blue falls back. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So just- And he has, go ahead. he has dressed his model in a muslin sheet from my dryer. That's what sheets look like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's fun to see his paintings because you'll see the same models and things uh, oftentimes. He, um, he was painting when the camera was around, but it was black and white. Yeah. So he's facing, he's got tons of photos that he's working from. He'd bring a model into his studio if he needed to. Most all of his paintings were done in the studio. Even his landscapes, he would build models and light them in his studio of little uh -huh. trees, you know, using model sets and different things and lighting. Oh, really? Like little architectural trees and whatnot? Yeah, I believe so. Yep. Um, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. So every, does everybody know Maxwell Parrish? Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Did you say that he does uh, underpaintings or, or toning? Is he under, he under to, underpaints in blue and white. And very and values of blue. You can see he kind of came across with a little bit of red, probably. And then he lets that completely dry. I don't know, and not much is said about his process. He did kind of defend and protect his process. He uh -huh. was the number one selling print artist in America. 
He did a bunch of work for early electrical companies, um, posters. It was said that like something crazy, like 70 or 90% of Americans had a print of his in their house at one point. Um, he, and so, so what you're saying is that he used it as a underpainting and then he layered with transparent paints on top of the blue? Uh, it look, looks like it, you know, to make it purple and uh -huh. then make these darker, but, um, but uh, he, these areas would have remained white in his underpainting. Okay. They're very, very detailed underpaintings. And then he would come through and glaze into them and then let uh -huh. that dry and then glaze into them. And he was really all about glow all about creating the illusion of light um oh, but your friend the avanis guy he when you said mid-value blue gray you meant that's what he toned, he toned his the whole paint. entire canvas yeah. yeah okay thank you i just want to make sure in my mind i got that clear great question so maxfield parish would have painted onto a white surface would then go and do all of his drawing all the shadow structures in blue in various values of blue and then, and I, again, I am only going off what I've learned and what I've observed in his paintings. Um, so I could be, you know, if Maxwell Parrish came back from the dead, he might be like, what are you even talking about? But, um, um, but then he would leave those areas white. That way when he glazed in, right, the light was shining through and coming back. So he's letting the transparency and the light bouncing off the white of the canvas do a lot of the work. And then the, the other uh, advantage of doing what you're describing, whether he did it or not, is that as you glaze over or scumble over and you're adding those really warm ochres, you're not creating mud because the blue's already dry. Yep. That is correct. And I don't know if you'd go back in and lift out areas before they dried or or if he was just super intricate with a little brush painting around those blues. I don't know how yeah. he did what he did. And, you know, in, in my opinion, there's never been another Maxfield Parish. So he definitely created his own thing, but we can still learn from some of the techniques. And that's, you know, sometimes I tone my canvas and sometimes I don't. And tone again is that initial lay in color. Not talking about the underpainting, not the design, but the color of the canvas when I start painting. Right. Sometimes I color it. Sometimes I don't. And when I don't, generally, it's with the idea in mind that I'm going to let the translucency of the color, the transparency, do some of the work, or I'm going to use that in some way in my painting. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Thanks. Hold on. I'm, I'm looking at the um, edges there in her hair, and um, it's a great study on edges there. You can see the That's light. Amazing up against the blue and then the dark up against the white and the um it almost looks posterized or it, her figure almost looks plastered on a little bit except yeah, there i definitely get that feeling in some of his paintings that there's this kind of cut out feel like he was very precise on his lines but then all of a sudden you get these soft edges and it almost it does two things right it kind of but the main thing it does is create a sense of movement. Right? Yeah. Can we see that one desaturated to see the edges of the hair? What did I just push? Cancel. Image adjust desaturate. And look how bright we just thought she was. Yeah. But she's really not compared to those clouds. And he's also, oh my God, a master of design. Look at this. Just, yeah. You know, and if, if you, he was my student, I may be like, Maxfield, look at these clouds following the shape of this hill. Come on, man. And look at these clouds following the shape of this hill. But the guy was a graphic designer. He was an, a big time illustrator. He's using these purposely. There may have been some font yeah. here that he really wanted to right. draw. Saturday evening by. post. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so, and also look how dark the sky is, the, the background sky. That is yeah, much darker blue. than you think. You're... Yeah, let's grab that blue. And I don't know if you guys saw behind me and when I, so, okay, I grabbed the blue. Wow. And it, it's, yeah, so it's definitely not in the mid, it's up darker and it's right in the middle of blue. It is blue, blue, right there. Very saturated, yeah. 
very saturated. It's not going towards white. It leans a little mm -hmm. more towards the dark side, but here's like high, high chroma, right? Mm -hmm. Up there and there. Yep, beautiful. And really shows you that, you know, within this mid range here, he's got a lot to play with. So, it, you know, compared to the white. So he definitely was not afraid to play up his extreme values. Look at the dark, dark, darks here. The dark, dark, dark in her hair helps draw our focus up here as well. Um, so much. Please, you know, you guys have so many artists to look at after class. I apologize. Good news is I give you permission to not wash the dishes or do any laundry today. You've got too many people. <laughs> Too many artists to look at. Oh, We're going to have to speed this up, but look at those extremes within temperature. So I can say, Michael Orwick says, I don't have to vacuum before you come over to my friends. Yeah, better yet. I tell you that you can tell your friends that they have to vacuum. <laughs> You're, you've got important things to do. And that's look at art and appreciate art and observe it and decide why is this working? What is it doing? Okay, who's this artist? This is Marcel Ryder. Mm -hmm. But look at that, right? I mean, it's still a nice painting. It's a beautiful drawing almost. It's, you know, it, it tells us, tells a story kind of, but it's anything but special. <laughs> Right, it's, you know, it's nice, but, oh wait, I don't have to do that, sorry. I can just do this, bam. Now it's special. Yeah. So what is doing it? His colors are pretty, there's no real bright brights, right? I mean, light lights, no, in the value scheme, nothing is white. Let's go ahead and bring in white, just so we can see how much more value range, he could have pushed this thing. Oh, look a minute, oh. right? Let's look at their dress, right? The dress, when we looked at it here, uh, when we looked at it here, doesn't that look like it's so light? Yeah, so white, yep. But I'm wondering not. how they keep them so clean. Yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, bam. Wow. So that is what we're keeping it within this, this very close in the value. But what's it doing, Michelle? What's what's causing that wonderful effect? What's making that special to us? It's the um, color, the colors next to each other, right? The color temperature. Yes, perfect. It's color temperature. Definitely, we've got warms and cools. What we also have is he's saturated his warms, hasn't he? I mean, Marcel could be a woman, I guess. I don't know. Uh, saturated is warms and desaturated is lights. I mean, ugh. dark saturated is yeah, desaturated shadows. Is darks, they're grays and cools. Yeah, that shadow is hardly dark at all, but it's very, it's, it's a bunch of gray shades. Couldn't you see this? Like, imagine again, like a, a white blossoming tree in sunset right? Or snow-capped mountain and sunset, right? It doesn't need to be so light. We can make it bright using our color contrast and our temperature. Ah, so much to learn. So fun. Wish I was my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right, let's keep going. I'd recommend you. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you, Marcel. That's wonderful. Um, very quickly, this is a Marc Bonet. I, he's another artist that I use in almost all my demos. I love his work. Really great at shapes and value contrasts. He's not afraid to uh, go really dark in his shadows. He's not afraid of to use black, um, I think. I don't know if, you know, it could be the photo, whatnot. But what I want to show you here was you've got this earth that's very... Uh, you know, kind of a, probably a light gray if we were to look at it in midday light, but in this evening light, right? The light is raking from the left to the right, striking the left side of the objects. And there's these little ditches or, you know, irrigation ditch and then the uh, plowed fields here, or the, um, the rows of the growth. 
and the light is just picking up the very tops of these rows and the very edge of this ditch. And it's the lights raking across this flat field back here, picking up on just the edges of these mountains back here, right? It's just so subtle that you don't even notice that there's light hitting these hills. You just know that it feels good, feels right until you begin to slowly observe things. Um, and yeah, then he's got the light on here, I, you know, and then he's always got these beautiful, not always, but often got these beautiful shapes at the base of the trees underneath that kind of create the focal point, right? He's got his guidelines coming in, all the lines kind of aim us right in there. And that is our focal point. But it's not so important. It's not so like, look here, look here, look here. It just kind of draws you into it. Oh, nice. And then he lets you explore. Unlike Ovanis is where it was just like, come back and look at my barn. Look at the barn. Look at the barn. How dare you look at my sky. Look at the barn. This one is, oh, yeah, that's where I'm supposed to look. But I want to look everywhere else, too. Let's desaturate and watch those hills. I've not desaturated it before, but I'm guessing that light in the dark is going to get really close. Um, <coughs> yeah, the light basically disappears. All right, watch, watch the pink. Yeah. Oh Here's wow. Blue. Gone. Uh. Simple design. Uh, he's the master of simplicity in a lot of his work. He's got some complicated stuff too, but so Bone B O H N E. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm saying his name right. I've never met him. Unfortunately, he used to live in Seattle, which would have been a great opportunity for me to meet him, um, but I never did. And he's since moved, I think, to the East Coast somewhere, maybe Virginia or somewhere, or I don't know. I guess that's not East Coast. I don't know where he moved anyways. <laughs> um, wonderful, right? Look at these, yeah. these. This appears so bright, these stripes of light in here, these kind of guiding you into the scene, but they're really... Yeah. They're bright, they're lighter, much lighter than the area around them. But he didn't go crazy. Let's again, bring in our white brush stroke. He could have gotten much lighter. Huh. Of course, we don't know what this actually looks like in, in the gallery. Totally not, nope. We get what we get. But, it, yeah. you know, giving yeah. us big shapes. Um, I, you know, <laughs> Very quickly, I'm just going to mention the rest of them and not go through all the an uh, analysis. You guys can look at them. And if anybody wants to bring up one and put it onto the main page and discuss it, you know, kind of what you're learning from it, that would be great. Um, what am I doing? View, fit on screen. Um, I love Kim English's work. Um, Kim English? Yep. Just uh, really, I mean, his paintings are really about beautiful. Jim English. Huh? Is it Jim or Kim? Kim. Um, I love his work. Um, and again, look within these shadows, all these different colors. You know, it gets warmer out here, cooler greens, all these. And look at back here what he's doing. He's letting, or he doesn't really care if you look. You know, you know there's a table, you know there's ground, but he just, meh. Nah. What edge? Who cares? It's not important. I'm just giving you just enough information. You know, you know something's happening back here, but you know, and probably a restaurant of some sort. But he really keeps you here, right? I mean, the whole painting is right here. This is all just supporting information. This just tells you, look how strong that sun is. Look at the, you know, strong cast shadow of my figures and. Look how big the contrast is. That's because it's strong light source, right? And then he tells us again up here, strong light source. And then he tells us in the rim lighting, strong light source. Um, and then within this chair, right? It's a shadow. It's on the other side of the sun, but it's still warm. It's just darker. Same with her shirt. It's still warm. I personally have a little bit of a hard time doing that because I consider myself such a valuist. I look to the you know, values first. And um, I need to probably start to experiment where I let these rich saturated colors play and exist within that space. Let's do our little trick. Shift control U. Yeah, I need to start doing that. Shift control U. It's the worst university. 
Can we pan out a bit? I want to see that um, the grass in the foreground. Yeah, so look how gray it is down in the lower left corner compared to the focus of the of the painting. Yeah, he preserves his white, doesn't he? Yeah, so even though you think you've got this really hot, glowy grass right there in the foreground, it's actually quite subdued. Right. Yeah, so there's um, learning constraint or learning when to use the weapons or tools. I don't mean to sound like I'm pro-war or anything. Keep using warrior <laughs> and the, you know, the weapons, um, but the tools we have, when to use them and when not to use them, right? It's just as important. Um, learning restraint. He definitely has his strongest value shifts, his lightest lights and his darkest darks. Um, prop mostly in this area. He's using the darks as a framing device. He's using the lights down here in shadows almost as a guiding, right? Like, look at that. It's a spiral, or not spiral, uh, radiating lines. Right? Let me grab a smaller mm -hmm. brush. I'll yeah. show you. And the yellow umbrella kind of balances out the, the yellow foreground grass. Yeah, yeah. So he's got repeating. Radiating lines. My good friend Amanda Houston uses radiating lines all the time in her painting. And they're so great. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I just traced lines that were on there. <laughs> and it looks so crazy, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. let's go back to before I used airbrush. Right, you see those lines? Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you did that. That's amazing. And they're subtle, right? I mean, soft edges on some of them. The only hard edges are right in the two figure shadows. Soft edge, real soft edge, but you still see it back here. Very muted lines. Again, if we desaturate this, watch these. Uh, this area within this square. Yeah. Watch what happens besides these highlights. What was it? Oh, shift control U? Shift control U. Boom. Right, they just disappear. Maybe yeah. I'll make it even smaller. Let's. Right, you see there's color shifts between reds and greens, pinks and purples. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Kim English. Right, it's not, it's, I, I, maybe I'm gonna ruin art appreciation for you, but you guys are to a level now that it's not enough to say I like or don't like only. You now get to say I like and why. This works and why. And that's how you're going to continually learn from other artists. Remember I talked last week about standing in the river as an artist. Did I talk about that last week? That we're learning from those that came before us. We're taking that knowledge and then we're going to create and we're going to share that knowledge with those that come after us. And that's how I think of painting is bigger than just me because painting can be kind of a self-centered enterprise right i'm ignoring my family i'm ignoring my cat much to his chagrin and uh not walking my dog when i had a dog my dog was always just looking at me like what are you doing you're just standing there why aren't we walking um you know we're ignoring all those but how you can justify it if you need a justification besides sheer enjoyment and creating beauty in the world is that it is we're a part of a community and it's part of a bigger thing and so by going and looking at the work of others and especially in the masters that came before us and, and taking in that knowledge and putting, you know, making it part of our work, it's bigger than us. It, you know, that, I'm just giving you justification why Laura is not doing the dishes. <laughs> I can't, I'm part of this huge never ending community. They need me. <laughs> They need me downstream. Another can all these 
these um, paintings that you're showing us here, are these all in the Color and Light album? Yes. Good. I will another, go back and study uh, them further. Yeah, another Kim English. Um, I love the warm, like reflected light within here. And you can see that the shadows underneath the steps are cooler than this strong um, cast shadow from the table. Look at the penumbra, the light, uh -huh. that area where the shadow and the light meet. Yeah. Um, a That's lot of great. artists, um, Eric Bowman jumps to mind. Um, a lot of artists will use the penumbra to great effect. I, I try to use it some. Um, and it's fun once you start to see it, you'll really see it in real life. Um, so Carol Marine is big on the penumbra. What's that? Carol oh, yeah. Marine. Yeah, for sure. For sure she is, yeah. Um, and then uh, Joaquin Soroya and uh, John Singer Sargent. I mean, Joaquin Soroya, oh my God, I didn't grab any of his paintings. Oh man, he's got these paintings where literally his model is standing, getting blasted by light so much that she's putting her hand up in front of her face so that the shadow is cast into her eyes. It is ungodly amazing. It is just, and you, when you look at this painting and this poor girl getting blasted by this light, you squint. <laughs> you can't not squint, even though you're not the one even looking at the sun like she is. It's so cool. So Joaquin Soroya. Yeah. All right. I just excused you from a whole nother day of uh, chores. <laughs> I was going to say those radiating lines were there again. You could just, they really popped out at me this time. That would, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where he, where he disappeared to when I clicked on him. Um, anyway. That's okay, if they were there. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm glad you saw that. I'm glad you're noticing that. Um, and that's, you know, something about design and everything. This and this painting, um, I uh, used to do um, fantasy art. In my very early career out of college and children's book illustrations and stuff and i got invited to go to comic-con which is you know the biggest collection of nerds in the world down in san diego <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful and i was in a booth and across the booth from me was this guy who i'd never heard of john watkiss and i don't i still <laughs> don't know much about him but you know for hours i was standing waiting to see if anybody actually wanted my autograph even though nobody knew who i was but that's what I was there to do is do little drawings and give out autographs. And I was sitting amongst a whole bunch of celebrity artists. <laughs> um, and so people would just kind of get my autograph because they figured he must be famous. I just don't know who he is. Um, but one cool thing is a girl walked up and go, I got a tattoo of one of your paintings. And that was wild <laughs> to see one of my little baby dragons on her arm. Um, but anyways. Oh, wow. That was a big deviation on the story. But anyways, across the booth, you know, the little alley was these two paintings, the originals, and they were big. And uh, I didn't even, I couldn't hardly comprehend what I was looking at. I was right out of college. You know, I, I wasn't even painting that much. I was doing more colored pencil and I was, I guess I was painting, um, but I, I was just starting and just learning. And I, I keep looking at these paintings and what's so funny is my daughter now has, without me even showing them to her or anything, she has both of these as little posters in her room. Mm. Um, I only just last night told her, I'm like, I met that guy. I talked to him. I stared at those paintings for hours waiting for people to ask for my autograph. Um, it, they're, they've been important to me and I, I think about them often. And when I came across them online like, a couple of years ago, it was really kind of like a, sweet memory because I, again i didn't even know who the artist was i didn't remember his name after i left um but what's special about these is the light and the shadow and then what makes this extra special is that within his shadow he's very conservative with the darks the darks are very purposeful look he uses them as a framing device right they're on the outsides and then within these shadows, magic, 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 magic. Look at those colors. Warms in his shadow areas, cools in his shadow areas. Got the penumbra over here with a little bit of red on the silhouettes. It gets more pronounced on these ladies. Look at that transition color, right? So each one of these 
he mixed the color. He didn't just squish them together like we like to do, like I like to do sometimes, where I just, oh, I would need these two to blend and I'll just, you know, take my clean dry brush and squish them together. He actually mixed new colors and put them down. So lovely. Magic, right? So those transitions in its cloud colors. It's just creating the transitions between. Look at this highlight on this hair of pink versus bright hot like this because it's in the shadow. So it's a reflective light kind of hitting in there. Look at this. We know that the light source is behind them, right? It's kind of coming in from over here, but look what happens in her arm. The darkest is away from that light, but inversely, and this side is being affected by the bouncing warm light. And then inversely, she's got the bouncing cool light hitting this side. Yeah. See, it's in the shadow, but it's warmer than this. And I, by warmer, again, we don't want to confuse light and dark, but it is warmer and this is cooler. This is a cool light coming, the warm light coming from what uh, the sunset or whatever that is. Hmm. Michael, what was his name again? His name is John, J-O-H-N then Watkiss, W-A-T-K-I-S-S. -S. I really, I think he may be an animation instructor, um, like for Disney or something like that. Um, I, I, I don't know much about him. I, I should, maybe that's what I'll do. Today's busy. After class, I have a meeting for a business meeting. And then after that, I do a demo for 72 people online. So. Oh, fun. Do you me. happen to know the medium of these two paintings of his? I don't. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. Looks like acrylic to me. Kind of does, doesn't That's it? That's what I was wondering. Nice and clean. Yeah, who knows? Um, good change. No. Um, this is, I was actually with Anton Pavlenko. This is one of his very early paintings. Right now he's much more expressive and um, this is very uh, focused for him, fit on screen. Um, I was with him. This is out at Salvi Island. For those of you who are Portland people, know that it's a, a rural um, farming um, island. Wait, who is this? Is this the same? What kiss still? Pav no, this is Anton Pavlenko. Portland. Oh, 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 right, right, right. It's a good buddy of mine. This is a really early one of his. Um, and just I'm just showing you temperature shifts and value shifts within. Um, this looks like in the style of Maurice Brown. Yeah, I'm having a hard time remembering Maurice Brown's work right now. He did a lot of stuff in the 30s that looked just like this, I think. Okay. He's not that prolific, though. He's, it's hard to find his work. Interesting, interesting. Um, I maybe, <gasps> oh, that's uh, Teresa Saya. She's at, this is actually a pastel, soft pastels. Um, I love her work. It's very, she's very much a colorist. I get to see her at a show in Portland this summer. Um, it borders on garish for me you know i hate the fact that this is recorded and that you know she might hear that but some of her colors are just they're just not for me they're too over the top but um but uh beautiful work i love her silhouetting of trees you can see right why i would like this because i i want to do a lot of this kind of stuff in my painting um beautiful cast shadows warms versus cools darks versus lights all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff. This is Ramona Youngquist, my friend um, that I'm talking about. Um, I use her every time. But again, let's just look at these cast shadows as they go across. Things just staying in their families, the lights and the darks separated. Look at the closeness of the value in the dark of the, I mean, the light of the tree and the dark back here. If you squint your eyes, they blend really closely together. Whereas mm -hmm. up here, the lights and darks have a much more bigger value jump. We go all the way back to the mountains, the value jump between light and dark all but disappears. It's just a temperature, a slight temperature shift. She's painting with a palette knife here, tons of texture. Um, yeah, she's just got, she's got energy. 
Uh, another one of hers is a little more subtle. It's got the cast shadow coming across the foreground, like we said. So it's fun to see. She does tons and tons of fields of flowers and almost always a white house in her painting. She's really got her, her subject, her thing. It's pretty fun. Even when we, when we were in Italy painting, she would still somehow find the only white house in Italy and put it in there. Um, and uh, But it's nice. I love seeing the light on the grasses and on the flowers. And then how, you know, we know that these are the same flowers and the same grasses, but just look at the difference between within the light and within the shadow. Um, I love the cast shadow on the house. I think that just does so much to uh, give us form and shape. I'm fortunate enough to own uh, two nice Ramon Youngquist paintings. Um, one I did as a trade for our paintings in Italy. So I actually have one of our Italy paintings and one I got at an auction and uh, feel a little bit guilty about it. People didn't know how amazing she was at this auction evidently because I got it for basically the price of her frame. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I felt a little bit guilty about that one. Um, this one I, I picked just because of the subtlety of the, the limited palette and just look at, you know, I mean, the greens are very vibrant. But just within all, everything in this is light, right? We know that this is that Mediterranean kind of setting somewhere where, you know, all the buildings are light colors. And it's fun to see cast shadows on there and just look at the colors, pinks and turquoises and all these beautiful colors that he's bringing in within the shadows. Um, but there's the value is not too extreme, right? The, there's only, what, a couple little blips of darkness in here, a couple little branches that are in the shadow here and underneath the grapevines. So let's do a quick um, shift, control U. Oops. Shift, control U. All right. Yeah, look at, you know, it's not very extreme value shifts at all. Like, you know, I know that a lot of us would have been tempted. You know what? I know there's a stair here, so I better tell you there's a stair here that, you know what I mean? We would over describe yeah. it. We don't need that information. Look at the, where the shadows change, right? It's just this tells us there's steps, there's a step, there's a step, even all within the same value, right? We don't for a second doubt that there's stairs there. So letting the structure, the shapes of our shadows do a lot of the work for us there too. Phew. Thank you, Mr. Peter Bezrukov. Is he Russian? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> those, those Russian artists who post are so amazing. So amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I just, yes. It's so hard, right? As a painter, you just don't want to go, you know, the comparison will kill you. <laughs> so you just got to go, okay, thank you for sharing. What can I get from this? What can I, you know, appreciate right. the scene, appreciate the beauty. And what is it? What are you reminding me of that I maybe forgot? Or what are you teaching me anew? You know, the reflected lights in the warm areas and the cool shadows. Oh, God. So much. Right? And you can tell these leaves up here are semi-translucent because it's not just dark. It's just darker, thicker, green, denser green but they appear to be in shadows. You can, uh, I can totally picture just walking down this street and going and getting some yummy bread because I'm eating carbs again because I'm in it Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and olive oil. And, you know what I mean? Like, uh, good painting. And that brings us to the reference. Let's take a break. What do you say? Okay. I, my throat needs some drink. Um, what time is it? It's almost 11. I'm never going to paint. Okay. Even if I don't paint and I just, well, maybe I will just ignore the value study. Do you guys understand the uh, grayscale, what I want you to do with that? And we'll use it. Maybe what I'll do is set it to the side of my painting and I'll test on there some of these colors. Cause I just don't think we'll have enough time to go through and do a bunch of colors, put them onto the grayscale and the gray blocks. And everything. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say 
you know, within the values, you can do so many colors. And within the different areas, you have different color or different temperatures within those colors. So you want to keep your warmer colors probably in your lighter, you know, areas. And is all this making sense? I, I've thrown so much at you in two hours, one hour and 50 minutes, sorry, even worse. <laughs> um, all right, 10 minute break. Let's meet back at noon. And um, yeah, I may have to sign the rest of the class because I just talked so much. But that's fine. All right, I'm going to do stop video. You guys are, please remind me.